Good morning from the entrance porch folks. I thought I'd start somewhere different for a change. I'm now ready to make my second cider of the windfall season. It's only mid-August, but I'm losing apples from the tree uh, quite heavily now, especially with the heavy rain that we've had. Uh, so I need to do something with them. Let me show you what I've got so far this week. So these are the windfalls that I've picked up and I go out every day a couple of times a day and pick up the windfalls and this is six days worth. So I'm going to go out there now, pick some more up and I'm going to weigh what we get in a week in terms of windfalls. So there's the tree and you can see it's laden with apples. Loads of them on there. But also loads falling off. Why waste them when I can use them? So that's what's fallen overnight. It's actually quite a small amount compared to what I have been getting. So there's my week's worth of windfalls in the kitchen. I'm going to give these a rinse and then I'm going to weigh them and I'm going to see what I get in one week. So there they are, all rinsed and draining. I've just got my scales out. I'm going to put this big pan on and then zero the scales. Right, let's weigh what I've got. There's exactly 98 apples here, by the way, of varying sizes. And those 98 windfalls, one week's worth, weigh exactly 4528 grams, four and a half kilos of apples. Now that is not bad going, and it's almost enough for what I need, but I will need a few more. So now I get my big chopper out and I'm going to cut these in half like so, pop them in the pan and carry on. This is going to take me five minutes or so, so I'll come back to you once they're all in there. Well, I've not managed to get all of the apples in here, as you can see, but I will have to find a different pan for those ones. But for these, I'm now going to add a little bit of water. I'm not measuring. I just kind of know when I know, but I'm imagining that I'm going to have one centimeter of water in the bottom of this pan now. So this pan is now on my hob. I'm going to turn on the gas and the heat. There we go. So that is on ignition and I'm leaving this now until it has come to a simmer underneath and the apple breaks down and begins to mush. I might need to move it around, but basically I'm using heat and steam to break down the apple fibre to make it into something that I can use to brew with. I'm doing it this way because I don't have a juicer, I don't have a press. I could freeze them, but I don't have a big enough freezer. So this is the practical way that I do it. It works for what I've got my setup in my kitchen. Okay, once these have broken down, then it comes to moving to the next step. I'll come back to you. Okay, this pan of apples is now done. I'm going to turn this off and I'm just going to demonstrate to you that they are completely and utterly mushy and there's loads of juice there as you can see. So they're done. Ignore breakfast. Um, over here is another wok of apples because I had too many for that pan and they're still going. So once all the apples have completely done and I'm ready to mush them, I'll come back to you. Right, I've turned both of these off now. Let's have a look inside this one. Get the potato masher in and you can see that this is lovely and pulpable. Now, I could use this to make the cider exactly as it is, but what I want to actually do is remove the nasties. So I want to remove the stalks and the pips and just use the nice flesh and some of the skin that will go through. So the physical volume of this has gone down quite nicely. I'm going to do the same with this one and then I'll come back to you. So I'm going to tip all of my apple mush into this wok. It will all fit now, just because I want to reuse this big pan. So this is now my setup. So what I'm going to do is take apples from here and put them into the sieve just there and the liquid will start to drip through. And when I've got so many in there, I'm going to give them some encouragement with this wooden spatula. 
So what I'm actually doing is pushing the apple through the sieve. So this is a colander sieve and I'm pushing it round so the flesh and the liquid goes through the sieve and all the hard bits that are left are the bits that I'm taking out. So this is going to take me a few minutes. Once I've done this first sieve I'll come back to you and show you what I've got. Okay, this is the first lot done. So this is the rubbish and that's the good stuff which is clinging underneath this and also in the pan just there. So I'm going to keep the rubbish because I want to weigh it because I want to see how much I've actually got from the apples. If you remember there were four and a half kilos of apples. Now I've added some water into the pan so I can't weigh the puree because that wouldn't give me an accurate reading. But if I weigh what I'm taking out of it, as in the rubbish, then I'll know how much apple flesh I've got left. I'm looking for five kilos of flesh to get this cider going. So I simply put the rubbish on here and then I'll be able to weigh it all. The rubbish that I take out doesn't get thrown away either. What I'll end up doing is watering it down in a bucket of water and then pouring it back onto the garden as fertiliser. Anyway, I've got quite a long way to go still. So once I've done all this, I'll come back to you. See you in a bit. Oh, it's a bit of a messy job as well. So that is the net result. I've got a lovely amount of apple puree there. So I'm just going to weigh an empty plate, which weighs 872 grams, and I'm going to zero those scales. So that's now on naught grams. So if I put this on top, that I've got 723 grams of rubbish for the garden. So I started off with 4528 grams of apples. I'm going to deduct from that 723 grams of rubbish. And that means that I've got 3.8 kilos of flesh here. Therefore, I'm after another 1.2 kilos of fruit matter to make that up. I might not use apples, I'm going to go away and have a little think about this. But just to explain to those of you who've seen me do this before in previous years, you might notice that I'm putting more fruit flesh in the cider now. I'm doing that simply because I get so many apples off my tree, I struggle with what to do with them. So I'm now adding more apples in. The downside to this is that I'll end up with more sediment, so there's potentially an efficiency conundrum with this too. But we'll see how it all pans out. If I can get four demijohns out of 22 litres, then I'll be happy. Of course, the other side to putting extra fruit in means you're going to get more flavour, and that cannot be a bad thing at all. So when I've worked out what I'm going to do, I'll come back to you. See you in a bit. So it's back to the garden. Let me show you what I've got. I've just picked a, a load of lovely rhubarb stalks. My rhubarb plant in the corner. So this plant this year has been absolutely phenomenal. I've had so much off it and you shouldn't really pick it at this time of year, but it's still producing tons. So the side is going to have rhubarb in it. So I've got a lovely bunch of rhubarb from the garden. Let's see what this weighs. Right, I've got 881 grams of rhubarb. Oh, 879 now. So I'm going to chop this rhubarb down into small pieces. I'm going to steam it exactly the same as I did with the apples. And then I'm going to push it through the sieve exactly the same as I did with the apples. So I'm not going to film that because you've seen me do it with the apples. It's exactly the same process. So once I've done that and I've got my rhubarb puree, I'll come back to you. Right, so what we've got in the pan just here is the liquid and some pulp from the rhubarb. That's the stuff which I can't get through the sieve, which is going to be mostly skins and some fibres. So I'm just going to weigh this plate and zero it. And then we can see how much of that is not going in there. So there's 156 grams of that rhubarb not going in there, but the rest of it is. Anyway, 
You know what flavour cider I'm making because you've seen the title of the film, but I've only decided an hour ago as to what this was going to be. I'm going to make a blackcurrant and rhubarb flavoured cider. Hope you enjoy the film. But I guess we better have a look at those key ingredients. And here they all are. Right, let's go to the left. So I've got my apple puree. 3.8 kilos. I've got my rhubarb juice and some pulp just there. Um, the amount escapes me, but I think there's about 600 grams worth or roundabout. My black currant is going to come from Ribena. I am going to put one bottle of Ribena, full sugar Ribena into this. It's 850 ml. They used to be a litre. Now it's 850 ml, but that will do. And that makes up enough fruit content to give this a really good flavour. Now I'm going to bolster this by adding an initial 1.5 kilos of dextrose monohydrate brewing sugar. I may end up adding more. I want this to have an original gravity around about 1.050. My yeast of choice today is Lalvin EC1118 Champagne Sparkling Wine and Cider Yeast, but I've only got a little bit of that left and I'm going to bolster it with this packet of Gervin or Jervin. How the heck do you pronounce that? Cider yeast. I'm going to give it some yeast nutrient. I'm going to put some pectolase in, in the hope that that will help this to clear in case there are pectic enzymes in this. And I'm going to be using about 18 litres of spring water. I'm using spring water because the tap water in Leeds is quite chlorine-y. Right, let's crack on with that recipe. I'm going to begin by adding 5 litres of spring water on top of the rhubarb pulp. So I'm going to add my brew sugar on top of the spring water. This is the first kilo. So I'm just going to pour that on top. Got away out another 500 grams now. Here's the last of it. So I'm going to put that in now as well. I'm going to give it a stir round. Then I'm going to put the gas on low. Woof. Turn that right down. And I want this to come to a warmth, but not a simmer. I just want the brewing sugar to dissolve. It does dissolve quite easily. So I'll come back to you in about five or 10 minutes time. Okay, the brew sugar has dissolved in that pan. I'm gonna switch the heat off. And it's now time to start putting all of this together in the fermentation vessel, which is a Rich's fermentation bin. And these are cracking. So I've got my fermentation bin in the sink just to keep it tidy. I'm going to begin by adding some spring water. So in goes five litres. Always makes me need a wee, but I'll hold it. Right, next the Ribena. And it's just a case of pouring that straight on top. Next, I'm going to add my warm pan of sugary rhubarb water. It's not hot, just warm. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little bit, in fact, I'm going to put two litres of spring water back into this pan just to wash out any bits of sugar and rhubarb flavours in there. There's no point in wasting it, is there? There's anything stuck in there. And then that's going into the bucket. So I'm currently on 15 litres. There's more to go in yet, because without my apples, it ain't a cider. And in they go. Oh, splash. I'm having a shower after this. Oh dear. So I'm just going to scrape this out, make sure I've got everything out of there. I don't want to waste anything. In fact, what I can do is I'll rinse it out with two more litres of spring water. So I'll just get two litres of spring water into this pan. It's a bit messy, but I always clean the kitchen afterwards. And I like to think I do a rather good job of it too. Right, appley spring water goes in. And I'm now over the 20 litre mark. I am on 21 litres. I'm going to take this up a notch to 22, yeah. Let's have a 
have a look now. Yep, yeah, that's on 22 litres now. So I've got my stainless steel spoon and I'm going to give it a nice big stir around. I want a consistent mixture. So I've got a consistent amount of Ribena, sugar, water, apples and rhubarb throughout the mixture and that I've not got layers forming because I need to take the original gravity and it must be accurate. Now the temperature of this is absolutely fine. It's room temperature. There's that much cold liquid gone in that I didn't need to worry about the warmth of the uh, sugar water. So this is absolutely right for taking the gravity. So in goes the hydrometer. And I'm looking for something around about 1.050. And I can see looking at this now that it's on about 1.030. So it's nowhere near enough. So I'm going to add another kilo of sugar. In fact, I'm just going to pour and stir. So I'm not weighing it. I'm just going to put it in. It will dissolve just fine. Right. I do often get asked, why do you use brew sugar and not just normal sugar? And if you go in the brewing forums, you'll see arguments for and against both. Some people would say it's snobbery to use brewing sugar. Some people would say you're being a philistine if you use normal sugar. The truth of it is I have found that I have had better tasting brews with brewing sugar. So I use it. It doesn't taste as home brewy as what normal sugar makes it taste. So I'm just giving this a stir because I want that sugar to dissolve and it will do. Right, I'm not putting any more sugar in, so whatever the gravity is now is what it's going to be. So now the foam has cleared, I can actually see that it's on 1.048. So I'm starting with an original gravity of 1048. I should hopefully get near enough 6% with that. So it's now time to add my dry ingredients. I'm going to begin with pectolase, which will hopefully break down pectic enzymes and leave me with a clear brew. I'm going to put one, two, three heaped dessert spoonfuls of pectolase into this brew. As far as yeast nutrient goes, I'm going to add one, two, rounded or heaped dessert spoonfuls in there. There's tons of nutrient in there with all the apple flesh, so I don't feel the need to add any more to it. Yeast is, so I've got my Lalvin EC1118. I've just got the tail end of it left in here. There's not much left, so I'm gonna sprinkle this on top. And now I've got my Gervin or Gervin, whatever the heck it's called. Um, and I'm gonna sprinkle that on top. So here is the state of play so far. And I'm just going to give this a little mix around so that yeast starts to fall in. I would be hopeful that fermentation will begin in a couple of hours time at the top end and that we're going to see some airlock activity quite soon into this. I'm expecting a fermentation of about 10 to 12 days and at that point after then, I'm going to be racking it into demijohns before bottling. Okay, I'm happy enough with that. Okay, I've got the cleaned lid from the Rich's fermentation bin, and this will snap into place. And the seals are brilliant on these. I'm just going to put a little bit more water in the airlock. Right, I need to tidy up, get my bucket labelled, etc. I'll come back to you shortly. Well, I'll tell you what, that's taken some doing. A nice and clean kitchen. And I've got this now in the fermentation bucket. I hadn't appreciated how full this bucket is and I may end up with an eruption, hopefully not. Uh, so let's look at the top. It's blackcurrant and rhubarb cider. It's got an original gravity of 1.048 and brew day one is today, which is the 6th of August, 23. So I'll come back to you with a fermentation update either later today or tomorrow. See you then.
Hey folks, I'm back sooner than anticipated because I've made a bit of a boo-boo. I was sat there having my cup of tea, thinking about this. For the amount of brewing sugar that I put in there, 1.048 just did not seem like the correct gravity. So I've come back, took the lid off, give it a stir around again, dipped the hydrometer in and left it. And in fact, the original gravity is 1.060. So I'm probably looking at an 8% cider and that seems about right for the amount of sugar that was in there. Evidently it wasn't dissolving as quickly as I thought it was dissolving when I put the hydrometer in there. Now it has dissolved properly, I can see the correct original gravity. So sorry about the confusion and for the mess about, but you know what, I'm showing you the process, I make mistakes just like everybody else does and I'm putting my hand up to this one. So the original gravity is 1.060 exactly. Good morning from the kitchen folks. It's brew day two for my blackcurrant and rhubarb cider. Let's have a look at it because we're going to see that fermentation has firmly begun. So let's look at the bucket to start with. You can see that there is a clear separation here to the rest of the uh, bucket. This is all the apple mush, which at the minute is at the top intertwined with the Krausen. Now over time that will fall and when that goes down here and forms a sediment line then I know that fermentation is getting towards the end. But as far as the bubbler goes, the airlock, I'm getting some good healthy strong bubbles through there so there's a lot of CO2 being produced within. I'm not going to open this and give it a stir today because I'm quite happy while this is at the top. I think when it goes lower, that's when I feel like I need to open it and give it a stir. So as it stands, all's good. Or as the Germans would say, alles klar. Right, I'll come back to you in a few days time. See you then. Good evening from the kitchen folks. It is brew day four for my blackcurrant and rhubarb cider. Nothing's happening in the airlock. Now, I don't believe for a second that it's finished fermenting. If you can look at the bucket from where you are, you'll see that the fruit is still at the top. I think we've got a bit of a blockage and I need to give it a stir, as in the, layer, the mat of apple is holding back the CO2. That's what I'm trying to say. So lid police look away, but it's coming off. Sometimes easier to turn it away from you. There we go, right. So before I go any further, and that does smell good, let's have a look. So that is what I've got. That is Krausen plus apple stuff. So a big spoon goes in. Let's just break that and give it a stir around. And you can see all those bubbles there. That is CO2. Now I'm going to need to do this, I think, every day now. Because eventually all that apple mush at the top will sink to the bottom. And that's where I want it to be in the sediment line. Definitely there before racking. But it smells absolutely fine, very cidery. And that's what you want when it's a cider. Try and prevent any oxidation if I can. Let's see if the airlock starts to bubble again after I've done this. So turn it that way. I'll give it a few minutes. And I'll come back to you with a progress update. So a 10 minute update and I'm pleased to report that the airlock is once again bubbling and yes, fermentation is most certainly still happening. So from this point onwards, every day, I'm gonna take off the lid, give it a stir very quickly, hoping not to oxidize it. And I'm gonna do that until fermentation looks like it's really ending and that the apple is sinking to the bottom. I'm expecting this to probably be another 10 days max before I go to racking. But the next update that you get from me will be Racking. So I'll see you then. Good evening from the kitchen folks. It's brew day 18 for my blackcurrant and rhubarb cider and today I'm going to be racking. Before I go any further though I just want to apologise for the background noise. Uh, I've got the air still on over there so that's just making a bit of a row but I need to get this done tonight because I've got lots of things to do tomorrow. So in racking this tonight, I'm going to be taking the cider out of here and putting it into Demijohns. So you'll note I'm going to be transferring it with this jug and I'm going to be pouring it through a funnel and in that funnel I have got a coffee machine filter to catch any chubby bits. So first of all, I need to get the lid off. 
and you'll note it's a very straightforward process I'll just show you inside so you can see that there is a lot of floaty apple on the top still that's fine so I'm going to begin by just dipping the jug in lifting it out and it does look quite clear inside there which is thankful and then I'm going to pour it into the first of the demijohns through the filter and you'll note that the filter is actually doing a great job of holding the apple back so I'm really pleased about that if I just dip this in you might be able to see how clear it is inside there it's clearing up naturally very nicely so anyway this is going to be quite a repetitive job so when I've filled the first demijohn up I will come back to you so I'll just see you in a minute hey folks first one done you can see there nice and full still a minor ring of bubbles at the top so there's a tiny bit of uh, fermentation still going on in here but I think this is going to clear up nice and naturally on its own which is a great sign I've got plenty more to do it's an entirely repetitive process you don't need to watch me do it I'll come back to you when I've done them all and we'll have a look at what I've got see you then <sighs> that's done let's have a look at what's left right first of all that's in the bucket that's just going to get tipped I don't need that anymore but it's behaved itself really nicely I think I'm going to get 24 bottles, 25 if not 24, from these four demijohns. I think this will clear up naturally. That was the first out, second out, third out, and the one which is a little bit less opaque, this one here, that was the fourth out. But essentially, I'm just going to label these demijohns up, and then I'm going to leave them now for another two to three weeks, and then I'll have a look at them for bottling. So when it comes to bottling, I'll come back to you. See you later. from the kitchen folks for my least favourite part of the brewing process it's big bottling day it's brew day 26 and this has been a pretty good turnaround let's have a look because look how beautifully and naturally clear that has dropped in the time since it's been racked which was only a week ago it looks brilliant I mean it does the first one is pretty much crystal clear it might be difficult to tell from on here Second one is pretty much the same, third one pretty much the same, and it's only when you get to the fourth one that you notice that there's a very slight bit of haze in there. But I want to get these out of the demijohns and into these bottles, and you'll notice that all the bottles I'm using today are clear glass, and I'm doing so purposefully because it's such a nice vibrant colour that I want to be able to look at it. And why the heck not? Right, let's crack on. So first things first, priming sugar. So this is standard household granulated sugar and I'm going to put about this much in which represents a heaped teaspoonful. And I'm putting that in each of the bottles so it will develop a sparkle. Within this there should be some yeast left in suspension. When it finds the sugar that I'm putting into here it will create a secondary fermentation. It's not going to be a huge fermentation, fractional difference on the alcohol but tiny but that fermentation creates a byproduct of CO2 and it's the CO2 that gives it the sparkle fingers crossed that's the plan anyway and I've got a feeling that this one's going to work out okay so with my demijohns it's the first one to get the bung out the siphoning tube goes in and I've got this black clip so I can measure or control where the bottom is and I'm going to push it right down to a couple of mils above the sediment line. I don't mind getting a tiny bit of sediment to start with because the first bit that comes out will go into the hydrometer tube. Right, let's rock and flip and roll. Mmm, tasty. Right. Oh yeah. Definite black currant on the lips. I think this is going to be a good one. Mmm. So I'll just move my hydrometer tube out of the way, we'll come back to that shortly. And into bottle number two.
and into the last bottle. And there we go, bubbles in the siphoning tube. Tell me that that process is over. I shall let the tube drain into the bottle and I'm actually going to tip what's in the hydrometer into that bottle and therefore I will have six full bottles. So before I can tip anything in I need to work out what the final gravity is with the hydrometer and I am finishing on a final gravity of 0 0.994 which is great. So before I work out the alcohol by volume, I want to get the bungs in before this begins to oxidise. So I've got my bungs in a jug of very hot water, softening them, makes them a bit more malleable to push in. I'll demonstrate this on one of the bottles, you don't need to watch me do it multiple times. So I get the plastic bung, push it in like that, and then I get a cage that goes over the bung. You pull the cage down tight and twist it and twist it and twist it and keep twisting it until it's nice and snug and it doesn't feel like it comfortably wants to give any more. So that is one bunged and caged bottle. Now the cage is a safety feature to keep the bung in place because when the secondary carbonation happens in here from the priming sugar meeting the yeast, then pressure builds up and if that cage isn't there, then you're gonna go pop and you don't want that. Okay, makes a mess. So that's one done. I've got five more to do. You don't need to watch me repeat this five times. I'll come back to you when I've done them. So that's my first six bottles in the sink. I'm just gonna get the uh, shower tap on and give them a rinse down because they've all got sticky residue on the outside and that's not nice. Okay, so before I go any further, I need to work out the alcohol by volume for this brew. So I take the original gravity of 1.060 and I deduct from that the final gravity of 0 0.994. That equals 0.066. I then multiply this figure by 131.25, and that gives me a final alcohol by volume of, drumroll please, 8.66%, let's just say 8.7%, because when that secondary fermentation takes place, that will go up just a fraction so 8.7 percent and i'm happy with that right that's the first damage on done i've got three more to go there is absolutely no point in you watching me repeat that process over and over so when i've bottled everything then i'll come back to you but there's somebody giving me evil stares outside that's saying let me in and i need to let her in there she is well that was a bit of a mission but the kitchen's now nice and clean. I better sort some bottle labels out. There's my bottles draining on the table. And here I've got a FOMOMO Bluetooth printer connected to my phone on which I've designed a, a very simple label, but effective in that it has all the information it needs. Black Runt and Rhubarb Cider, 8.7% ABV, and today's date, 31st of August, 2023. I'm asking it to print 24 copies and I've got a feeling that this is going to run out halfway through, so I've got some spares just in case. It did it all. Brilliant. Right, it's labelling time. So it's nice to take a bit of pride in the appearance of your brews. I always think so anyway. Especially when you can get the sticker on straight. Helps. There's one. I've got another 23 to do. You don't need to watch me do that. I'll come back to you when I've done them all. Okay, all the labels are on. And this is where my cider is going to condition for at least the next month. Let's have a look. So this is my drinks cabinet. It's in my living room. The temperature currently is 21 degrees Celsius and it is the 31st of August. So we're not far off autumn, but it will stay warm enough in this room for these to condition. The room itself is attached to my conservatory, which is south facing. That heats up like a greenhouse and keeps everything nice and warm in here. 
The conditioning process will allow the flavours to develop, so they should improve, they should mature, I should start to be able to get a differentiation between the rhubarb and the blackcurrant, fingers crossed. The apple might be more subtle, it could be more of a bulker. But what it will also do is allow that yeast to find that sugar, smash it apart, cause a secondary fermentation and give it a lovely sparkle. So I'm going to open this in about a month's time, might be five weeks, might be six weeks, might be four weeks. But when I do open it, that'll be the next film, so I'll catch you then. Good evening from the kitchen, folks. It's my blackcurrant and rhubarb cider grand opening night. It's brew day 60, and doesn't it look lovely? Okay, the bottle's a little bit wet because it's been in the fridge, but yeah, what a beautiful colour that has worked out at. So, I can see that the bung is minuscule raised, so I've got some hopes that I'm going to get some carbonation and some sparkle. But essentially, I want a good, it looks good, so I want a good smell, a good taste and some carbonation. Taste wise, I'd like something that's in the medium dry ballpark, if possible. And I'd like it to be really fruity. So let's get this cage off. Now, am I going to get a pop? Oh, yes, I got a pop. Look at that. Immediate vapour, rush of bubbles to the neck of the bottle. Got to be happy with that, haven't you? That's ace. Right. I've got my Wakefield Festival of Beer 2015 glass. Eight years old, flipping heck. Oh, that looks absolutely superb. Brilliant. So before I get down to the serious business of tasting, let's get the uh, cover photo for the video done. They always look like that, don't they? Right. I should think of a different pose. Immediate hit of blackcurrant. That is banging. It's obvious. It's just there. Yeah. It smells like Ribena. What a surprise. Wow, that's gassy. Really gassy. And you know what? The Ribena isn't overpowering at all. I've got what I asked for. It's medium dry. Not too dry at all. It's medium dry. It's very fruity. Definitely a cider. Now the overarching flavour is blackcurrant. It's massive. The apple from the cider is there in the background. You can tell it's a cider, but I'm sad to say that the rhubarb isn't that obvious. If I didn't know that it was there, I would never have guessed that it was there. Yeah, smells lovely though. And what a great summer drink that will be. So if I leave some of these for next summer, I'm going to be in a happy place. It's conditioned absolutely perfectly. Delicious. I'm really, really happy with this brew. It's turned out spot on. Pretty much exactly what I would have wanted. It would have been nice for the rhubarb to come through. But you know what? Beggars can't be choosers. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. That's how it works out. Tis the journey of home brew. Right. Anyway, folks. I've enjoyed the process. I'm certainly going to enjoy the drink tonight. I hope you've enjoyed the film. Thank you very much for watching it this far. Please like, subscribe, comment, all those things that help me, analytics, help me get up there. that will be great, you know, and then I can retire. Right, cheers folks, been a pleasure, and I'll catch you on the next brew, whatever that may be. The film that you've just watched is a Moss Home and Garden production. You can find more by going to www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk. I'd just like to say thank you very much for supporting my YouTube channel and for watching my films. It really is very much appreciated. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to my YouTube channel in order to receive future updates about the Home and Garden films which I upload. You can find my YouTube channel by going to www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk Please click on the red subscribe button. When you've done that, a little bell will appear 
If you press that also, then you'll get future updates about the films which I upload. If you like my films, if you like my style of filming, then you might also like my travel channel, which you will find by going to youtube.com forward slash Stuart Moss or typing www.mosstravel.tv. Again, if you could subscribe to that channel, it would be hugely appreciated. If you'd like to get Moss Home and Garden updates on Facebook, then please open Facebook and do a search for Moss Home and Garden and you will find the page. If you like the page, then you will get future updates on there. And if you'd like to connect on Instagram for home, garden and travel photography, as well as some stories, then my username is Stu Moss, S-T-U-M-O-S-S. If you'd like to connect on Twitter, then my username is at Stuart Moss. And if you'd like to contact me about film usage or any other issue, please just email me on stewmosshomegarden at gmail.com. Once again, thank you very much for supporting my channel, for watching my films. I do appreciate it. I'd just like you all to have a great day.